When kids just won't listen, parents often feel stuck between two choices, to give in or get angry. It's exhausting. We give you the top techniques directly from the experts, helping you on your path to a more peaceful, respectful, and joyful life with your kids. Hey, here's something new on the show, our first video podcast. For the video version of this show and all the future episodes, you can check out Getting Kids to Listen on YouTube. If you prefer the audio version, we will continue posting that on iTunes, Spotify, Anchor, and most podcasting channels. And all of the links to those things will be on the website and in the show notes. My first guest on video is a talented music therapist. She is Haley Francis Can. She currently provides music therapy services in Canada, and throughout her life, Haley enjoyed performing in various ensembles and choirs in the community and volunteering at hospitals and senior homes. This led her to pursue a career involving music and connecting with people in a meaningful way. She got a Bachelor of Music Therapy degree at Acadia University, and in her music therapy work, she often works with children on the spectrum or with developmental disabilities. She helps kids set goals and improve skills in communication and social interaction using her creative and fun musical sessions. Haley's love of the arts has also prompted her to author a children's book recently released. What can we learn from Haley in this episode? While she talks about how parents can get kids started in music training, her most recommended musical instrument to use with kids, and plenty of tips on transforming negative behavior into something positive. So, tune in! Get it? Here we go. Haley Francis Can, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Should be fun. So our first, yeah. my first time trying out video formats. So we'll see, see how it goes. Thank you for being a guinea pig here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm honored, honestly. <laughs> Great. Um, all right. So we've had a minute to talk and we've talked about our, our musical backgrounds, but for this show, the important question, I think the most important question is what is it? that you love about working with kids? I love that kids don't have a filter. I'm, I really enjoy the stage in life when um, children just are as expressive as they want to be. Um, and I think it's, um, it's very much uh, a paradigm for me. I work both with seniors and I work with children and I think by the time that you reach the seniors age it's kind of almost um, mirroring that kind of same behavior yeah. of uh, just having no filter and being able to um, express in with freely without um, feeling judged or um, having those preconceived notions that we create as we get older yeah. and so you know you can just let loose and have fun with children and they're willing to give that right back to you. Yeah. 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 Oh, and unlike the seniors, um, them being unfiltered, you know, they're not going to say anything. Well, I guess they do say things that embarrass us or, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, kind of a different, it's... a different field of unfiltered thoughts. Yes kind of yeah they're more matured unfiltered thoughts for sure yeah. but um still the same premise of you know um free to express it and without judgment um, of themselves completely you know it's just whatever happens is is what i'm willing to offer you in that moment they're really present they know how to embrace the present which i i enjoy and what would you say is the main thing that you've learned from working with them? Uh, from working with children? Mm 
Um, well, they've taught me to be, um, to embrace that as well, to be a little bit more um, understanding and patient and um, just willing to embrace that silly side of, of who I was when I was a kid. You know, that comes back to life when you are engaged in music therapy or any kind of play therapy with children. Yeah. Um, so you are a music therapist currently. Yes. Yes, I and am. And can you describe what the environment looks like that you work in and yeah, so um, when I work with children, it's mostly in either a school environment or uh, a community setting where um, uh, groups of children come together. So um, when I'm in a school environment, we usually go to um, like a, a designated space for um, where sensory activities happen or um, you know, just a space with limited distractions. If I'm working with children that have um, attention challenges, uh, so the, the more minimal the space, the better, so that everything we bring into the space is, is fueling um, that side of their attention and focus, and they can really be uh, present in whatever tasks that we have to accomplish, which for them just looks like a fun time, you yeah. know? And this is, the schools are public schools in Canada, right? Yes. For our listeners who are wondering where, the, <laughs> where this is in their schools. Oh, yes. I didn't mm -hmm. mention that. I work in Canada, yes. Right. Right. <laughs> it reminds me, I've had a, an Australian guest or two, and it sounds like they're doing a lot of, a lot of interesting extracurricular therapies and, and just working with kids in really unusual ways compared to here in the States. Yeah. So I'm looking forward yeah. to learning more about that. Um, yeah, me too. And are these elementary age kids or what ages? Yeah. So elementary, um, age kids that I currently work with. Um, I know that my colleague has some, um, uh, uh young adults who, who she works with, um, which we, we group all together. So young adults and children, um, we work with them in a similar way if they have um, developmental uh, challenges. So, um, but we'll separate them according to their needs and, and their goals. And um, yeah, so it could, it could be older children as well. But for right now, I mostly see ages six through 10 for me um, and my caseload right now. Yeah. Is it, um, I'm still trying to picture, um, is it different from when I just think of a music class? Like, you know, I had music classes when I was in elementary school and middle school. Um, yeah. what, what, makes the, what, what makes it music therapy as opposed to here's an instrument? Yeah, well, that's a very important question um, because I think from um, an onlooker's perspective, it could appear similar. Um, I think the clientele that we see is what makes it the core difference. Um, also, I think in a music class, the goal in that space is to learn or to achieve a certain proficiency in um a musical skill, whereas in a therapy setting, the goal would be to um, address different elements of social and behavioral functioning of of that student or um, whoever's in your in your therapy group. So, um, for example, uh, whether they're working on turn taking or um, you know, maintaining, uh, sustaining attention for a certain period of time or, you know, learning social cues, um, how to say hello and goodbye. And, and you can incorporate some of that academ academic um, learning into your therapy session if that's something that will be of benefit to that child in, in that time in their life. 
but the the main part of of therapy is just to work on bettering those social and behavioral um, and and um, emotional skills. Yeah. So it's a it's a little different. Um, music is still the the main medium of therapy, so it can look similar, but the the premise and the goals behind uh, each are very different. So working with kids that age, what are some of the challenges that you face? Uh, challenges. I think that um, on top of the, the funding thing that I said earlier and not being able to uh, see them as regularly as um, would be beneficial to them. Um, I think that sometimes um, the clients that we see often have autism or um, some type of developmental uh, challenge and it can be difficult for, I might get in trouble for saying this, but sometimes it can be difficult for parents to, you know, let their children um, grow and learn as an individual when you've been, um, you've been that source of comfort for that child for their whole life and you have developed a certain um, uh, want, willingness to protect that child at any cost and, and hold their hand in, in situations because um, they need support. Um, and it's very clear that they need support. But sometimes in therapy, it's, it's better for the child to, to learn and grow on their own what are, um, the, what are the symptoms or effects of that when, when a parent is you know, oh, providing too much comfort, if you will? Um, how does that show up in the child, do you think? Um, I, I think that it becomes a stimulus of, um, of comfort for them where if a challenging situation were to come up, um, they don't have to necessarily deal with it on their own because they have somebody to do it for them. Um, and I think that can get in the way in the future, <laughs> you know, as they continue to grow up. And um, uh, it's just, it's great to, to be able to show parents that they are able to do it, do something without, um, you know, the hands-on support of, of, a parent doing things for them. Um, <clears throat> so at that kind of transition period of, of uh, letting go can sometimes be challenging, but once it happens, um, I think the parents are really grateful because you know, then they have you know, um, half an hour in their day to be able to sit down and have a cup of coffee or sit down and just have a breather and um, check things off their list where, as um, they would have been able, they would have been in the session with us, um, you know, worried about what the, the child was doing and how well they were participating and how well they were singing along and, you know, those kinds of um, anxieties that, that parents can have when, um, you know, they want their children to do well at something. You've talked about challenges from funding perspective and you've talked about challenges from parenting perspective what, yeah what are some examples of things that the kids are throwing at you in in sessions that you come across most often and can we look at how how you handle that yeah so um within sessions um you know i don't i don't really see them as challenges <laughs> Because I can really work with anything, but, um, you know, let's say a temper tantrum were to happen and, you know, just, you know, a big buildup of anxiety and energy um, that somebody is expressing in, um, in a music therapy setting or perhaps a group setting. I think that's where the challenge comes in is when, um, you know, there are conflicting behaviors within um, a group setting and depending on how one child responds to another child's behavior and so continuing to work on that social element. Um, for me as a music therapist I don't find that 
particularly challenging, but I could see from an onlooker's perspective how um, how that could be perceived as a challenge. Um, for me, because the use, uh, the medium that I use is music, it's very um, it's very simple for me to validate that child's behavior through um, through rhythm. So I, it's my job to meet that child where they are, and if they're having a very frustrating day and they just have um, so much energy in them that they just you know, they're, they're letting it out by screaming or crying, you know, um, perhaps we, we play all that frustration out on the drum, like wail away. (laughs) That's okay. Get it all out. Um, or, you know, if, if it's affecting other, other children, we'll maybe split up into two groups and have, um, one, one group of children, um, participating in uh, one group of activities and then the others participating in more vivacious and energy um, filled activities that will help to get all of that frustration or anxiety out about what what is happening if they need to explore maybe they feel uncomfortable in a space and and they just want to you know get their bearings um that is totally fine with me um i just make sure to let them know that i'm listening and to feed off of whatever that is whether that's matching um every move they make with their feet on on the drum or in my singing or um you know there's anything that they're able to give me that I'm able to put into some form of, of musical intervention or activity. Um, that's my job as a therapist to let them know that I see them and, and that they're being heard even in a frustrated state. Okay. So the kid, the kid is um, having a tantrum and you're able to match them with, um, rhythm with song with instruments yeah in a way that that lets them know that you're you're hearing them you're attending to them you're not you're not um challenging them or 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 telling them that they can't do that yes in that instance um especially when um you know if it's for example, first meetings, um, and you know, we still have to build that relationship with one another. Um, I think that's totally fine. Um, as we get into the heart of therapy and we've been seeing each other for a long time, and if that behavior were to be something that persists, um, then we would work on functional ways to manage that behavior so that it doesn't, um, it doesn't, Uh, It's not a transitional behavior into their everyday routines when something isn't going their way. So um, we would, if that were to be um, a repetitive behavior to um, negative stimulus, then it would be put into their care plan to try and um, to support that behavior and change it into something positive. Um, So and that for that, it, that would be something I would recommend um, therapy happen one to one. Yeah. I'm I'm curious still about that that first that first approach, the musical approach. Yeah. Um, especially as if I'm at a playground and I don't have any immediate musical instruments at hand and I'm dealing with a kid with a tantrum is there any way that that I could implement some of that without being a trained music therapist and without having a keyboard strapped to my back yeah so (laughs) the keyboard I just think of um Dick Van Dyke from Mary Poppins (laughs) (laughs) that was the image you put into my head just now which is awesome I love that um that would be incredible if we could have that at a playground. Yeah. <laughs> but um, more pianos no. in public. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I think that rhythm tends to work really well with children who um, 
perhaps don't have social cues that um, we we might be inclined to have from from birth. It's just sometimes you need an extra stimulus. So rhythm. Um, you, there are match, metronomes that you can download on your phone apps that you can use. Um, that's really great to have on hand um, if somebody if a child is in a state of um, a temper tantrum or just some behavioral struggle that's happening and, and you need to get their attention and to um, make sure that they are focused on what you're telling them. Um, because I think that's one of the main challenges when, when a child is in a manic state, it's just they're not paying attention to anything you're saying. So if you're shouting at them or um, trying to discipline them, they they can't compute because you know they're they're just um, um, their their body is is all over the place and they need something to ground them. So I find metronomes really really work and they're accessible to um, anybody really um, or to if you have the means to have you know a drum that um, symbolizes you know this is my grounding drum. This is what I'm going to bring out when my child is having a rough day and we're just going to sit here and we're going to bang away at it until we find a place of, of happy medium where we're able to come down in energy. Um, and so I think, but the metronome is more accessible, I think, for parents and for teachers. Um, and surprisingly, because our, our bodies are so responsive to rhythm, it, um, like it sounds like it's so simple, right? right? It's not something that you would think about using, but it, it is, it's something that will get their attention. It's something that, you know, at least for a little while, you'll be able to sit and, um, have a conversation with them or, you know, it'll soothe them because you can change the tempo of whatever your metronome is set to. So if they're like in a manic state and you put the, the metronome on like 74 beats per minute um, and then you want to get them down to like um, somewhere in the 50s, 60s area, then um, you could do that slowly as the child responds to each beat. And is it just making a tick, tick sound or is this? Yeah, it's just the, it's literally just the tick, tick sound. And are you asking a... them to respond? Are you, are you engaging them? Or is this just kind of a, is this just kind of a secret weapon that you are able to slip <laughs> in and, and suddenly they're, they're in tune with it? Sometimes it could be both. Sometimes I have it playing in the background if I feel um, like um, something is getting out of control and I need um, to maintain some focus or, or attention. Um, but also I've bought it. I've like, you know, just presented it to, to um, the child. I've given it to them in their hand. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. They just sit there and they watch and, um, even sometimes the visual stimulus of like seeing the the metronome tick away is enough to get them to settle and focus on one thing. But also because they can feel it through um, or they can connect with that rhythm through their through their bodies, our our innate responses are to like tap our toes or clap our hands or to move our bodies so that we become in tune with that rhythm um, and. The, like think of yourself if you're sitting at a concert and you're really in in into the music you start tapping your feet or clapping your hands or nodding your head without knowing you know or um or you know having complete control over that action it's just something that is responsive uh, i have adhd and i have found that i cannot sit and do any focus work without some music in the background for more than about five minutes. Um, is there research behind that? And do you have any recommendations around, is that also something that, that should, that we could look at like beats per minute or, or styles, yeah. or is it just kind of, Hey, this kid likes this song, this Barney song, put it on repeat. I mean, is there, 
No, there, there's lots of research. Um, if you look up the uh, Neurologic Music Therapy Academy, they have done a wealth of research on these techniques specific to um, uh, uh, rhythm, entrainment, and kind of our physiological responses to music. Um, our physiological responses, our cognitive responses, and um, some social emotional responses to music. So um, using that model, which is what I practice from, um, there's a, a wealth of knowledge surrounding why rhythmic um, entrainment or use of rhythm, rhythm is a valid tool to use uh, with children that have um, attention deficit disorder or um, who have autism um, or, you know, really um, struggle with social cueing and, and things like that. It's just, um, yeah, there's a wealth of knowledge out there about that. And I would encourage you to go look it up. It's, it's really informative. Um, there are even classes people can take that are not specific to music therapists. So, um, yeah. If someone's just feeling overwhelmed by that, by the whole idea of this modality of music and, um, you know, the getting into the research and maybe they don't feel like they have the right, you know, sound set up. They don't all have a sure SM57 or whatever on hand. Yeah. How do you, um, what would you recommend for just the average person um, to get started in um, experimenting or learning about, about this? Yeah, well, um, the great thing about music is that you don't have to have a whole bunch of tools. You can use just your voice. And if you're not confident with, with your voice, you know, you have hands, you have feet, you have, you know, tools that you can use to just help um, even establish that sense of, of grounding with a steady rhythm. Um, you can do that on your own without any tools necessary, right? So um, I think that's the really great transferable thing about um, the world of music. You don't have to be proficient in anything. You don't have to have, you know, all the Barney um, CDs or access to YouTube. You, um, you know, you can use what you have, um, which is why I think that it's so um, effective, especially with children. Um, because, you know, just like us, they're using the tools that they've been giving and um, making the most of it. So I think that we have to meet them where they are and just um, be vulnerable sometimes. You know, we, we don't like the sound of our voice if we haven't been trained professionally, but, you know, the sound of a parent's voice to their kid is going to be the best voice they've ever heard especially during those childhood years, they are going to connect so, um, so intimately with the sound of their parents' voices. Yeah, it reminds me of the um, kind of teddy bears and stuff you can buy where you can put your own voice into them and then the child can listen back. Yeah. I guess now with, with smartphones, the sky's the limit, really. <laughs> exactly. Just, just careful with the auto-tuning, like you don't need to... <laughs> No, you don't need to go full T pain mode on your children. And, and <laughs> I guess okay. if you're living in an apartment, you know, you also don't need a, a full drum kit or like a trumpet or something. There's no, no, um, exactly. You can, um, there are like little disposable, um, frame drums that you can get, um, for like under 10 bucks really, um, anywhere. And, um, you know, they're not the best quality, but they work. Yeah. And they're also, if it breaks, <laughs> it's not the end of the world, right? Uh, if you were going to recommend a single instrument, let's, so let's just say, just in general, um, for people to, to have on hand, what do you think it would be? Um, I would say an ocean drum. Tell me what an ocean drum is. <laughs> an ocean drum is um, just a, a 
it's a round circular drum. Um, they can come in different uh, sizes. Um, there are some that have, you know, pictures of, of fish on the bottom of them so that you look inside and you can see, um, you know, fish or some sort of scenery underneath. There are some that don't have anything. They're just plain. But um, on the inside, there are beads that you can move around and it creates the sound of, you know, waves crashing on the, the sand um, at the beach. And it's really a, a relaxing and um, grounding sound, but also because it's still a drum, you know, there's always the option to, to beat on the top of it. Um, but I find that children are very... Um, all of their, their senses are, are just excited when they yeah. see an ocean drum. Um, and because it has those uh, relaxing kind of elements to it, when you play it, it can be very um, mindful for them to just sit and have something um, creative to do um, with their parents or by themselves to explore that sound and the different kinds of sounds that you can make with that one instrument. Yeah, I've never heard of it. I'm looking forward to learning more about that one. Visual, yeah. it's got the beads, it's got, I'm guessing kids of all ages could appreciate. Yes, appreciate exactly, it. exactly. I thought you were going to say, I thought you were going to say shaker. Oh. <laughs> What I love yeah. about a shaker is that you, you won't bang, you're not going to go around banging things with it. Like if, if, if it just fits in your hand, you know, it, it's, you have to shake it. Um. Yes, you do. It's also easy to throw. Oh yeah. So I wouldn't give it to a child who's in an agitated state. <laughs> yeah. And because then you'd have to practice, you know, your ducking, um, yeah. which I've come in contact with a lot. Sure. So <laughs> sure. yeah. Yeah, it's always something I don't think a lot of people have um, had much experience or, or know that much about the ocean drum, but it's always a favorite in, in whatever setting I bring it to, not just children, um, but I think because it has all of those kind of sensory elements to it, it's what makes it such a great tool to use. This might be a little bit off subject, but what do you think about uh, formal music training? and ages and you you have to or you don't have to uh, mindsets around that um formal music training obviously i went through formal music training so um you know i i had a love-hate relationship with it myself knowing that i i enjoyed music um i I think that if you're going into, you know, like a performance field or if, you know, your child has that inclination to, um, has a desire to really learn more about a specific instrument, it can be a really great skill set to have. Um, but I don't necessarily think that it's something we, um, like it's not something that is, is highly necessary. Um, per se, if, if, if you don't have that kind of inclination. Um, it's a very useful, useful skill set to have in, in all regards because all of the, the things that, you know, are beneficial for music therapists as um, using music as a medium, you know, music has so many um, impacts on your brain and your body. So whatever um, capacity that you're engaging in music, whether that's um, formal training or in a music therapy setting, um, I think it's highly beneficial for our, our, our bodies and, you know, our brains and our development. Um, but in terms of, you know, pursuing that further, that's really, you know, a judgment call parents and, and individuals have to make, right? Uh, and you had said earlier that um, as you went through your uh, music therapy training, that there were three main instruments. And I'm wondering if um, you can tell us again about those three instruments and if you would also recommend them, if just kind of as a blanket recommendation for for people with kids thinking about what to get them started on. Yeah. So um, in my degree, I had to be proficient in voice piano and guitar. Um, 
And for, you know, the voice, it, I think voice training would be um, very beneficial for children who are needing to, um, you know, learn uh, more about ways to positively use their voice and um, knowing how to feel confident with, um, you know, just even performing if they were going to perform and, and feeling, um, you know, there's so many stages that, that get you to a performance stage, right? You have to learn to practice. So that, that's a, a level of self-determination and, and um, you know, um, um, I'm struggling with the word that I'm thinking of, but, um, you know, it takes a, a certain amount of drive within yourself to be able to sit down and learn the music and to be able to um, do it consistently um, to a place where you're able to, to perform it on stage. But to learn about the, the different ways that you can use your voice, um, I think that's a really special thing for, for children to be able to do. Um, for guitar, that's really great because you're using all of those fine motor skills. Um, and, and so if, if that is something that, um, you know, interests you, I think that's also a great outlet because it's really, um, it's, it's a simple one to pick up and, and it's a tool that you could have for the rest of your life in terms of other kind of emotional processing a lot of people use the guitar in, you know, efforts to songwrite, and um, that could be another emotional outlet for somebody who, um, as they as they develop through life, it's sometimes great to put down your words in song, and that could be a great tool for you to use to accompany yourself. Um, for piano, that also um, uses a lot of your fine motor skills, and because you're having to use both your hands and your feet, kind of like um, drum kits, you know, it takes up more um, cognitive energy for you to process both left hand and right hand and reading in two clefs. And um, so that kind of um, ele academic element and, and, and cognition is something that um, is transferable as well into, you know, everyday life. And they're really good skills to have no matter what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guitar is definitely um, up there on ease of ease of learning, picking up and taking around, taking to the beach. Yeah, very accessible. <laughs> that one. The other, the other guys in the band are, are jealous of the, of the, you know, the guitarist gets to just carry his around everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's it's quite accessible, um, which is why that's one of the instruments that I use most often in sessions is I carry my guitar because I can walk around with it and um, move around in the space with it and be present with the kids that I'm working with. So, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> when you talked about kids kind of taking their energy out on an instrument, I'm I'm sure you've heard the occasional passerby say, "Don't don't play it so hard, you know, you'll break it." <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think about that when you hear that when you see an eight year old banging on an acoustic piano, for example? What's your response? <laughs> well, it's yeah, you always get the be gentle, be gentle, and you know sometimes you just don't want to be gentle. We know that as we when we grow up and. Um, you know, um, a piano is um, ideal for, for that. Like if you want to bang on it, you can bang on it and it'll still be intact. You know, things like drums are, are a little bit more um, malleable. They, they might, you know, you could hit a hole through a drum kit, um, but then you learn. Right, right. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, uh, I think that it's all about balance and, and sometimes children, when they're in a state and in um, <clears throat> that setting, they're just trying to test your boundaries and see what you get a response out of. And sometimes if you, if you don't get, you know, um, visually distraught at the thought of them pounding away at the keyboard, 
sometimes that can trigger in their mind, well, I guess that's not so interesting to that person. They're not giving me the attention I'm looking for. So they might not do it anymore to that extent. Um, So I think it's important for for them to explore that and to see, like, like, you know, um, there are there are boundaries within this this setting and you know you can explore as much as you want but there are some things that i'm going to congratulate and some things that you might not get the response you want from me yeah yeah uh we could talk about this all day it's one of my favorite things is uh kids plus instruments so yeah i know i (laughs) I know we could talk a lot and I really appreciate your added wisdom of, of all the, you know, background you have in all of it. Um, do you have any specific resources that you would point people towards? Um, obviously there's your website and we can talk about your stuff and your book too. Yeah. So I did, I, I wrote a children's book. Um, actually, I think I have one right here. Uh, Manny's mom, the music therapist. I wrote this book um, just so that um, the ideas of about music therapy and our whole philosophies and our clinical work could be more accessible at um, you know younger learning levels. So right now, like you were talking earlier, there's so much um, research, and you know it's all heavy right, right now behind the topic of music therapy and there's nothing really that's accessible um and a lot of music therapists have the same story if they didn't know that this was a profession until you know later in life um so i i wrote this because i saw that there was that gap and i figured if parents and and children at a younger age knew about the benefits of music therapy and that it existed even (laughs) as a form of therapy um, that, you know, that bridge and gap might, might close a little bit. And, um, you know, we, we could use the benefits to help so many, um, people, you know? So yeah, I wrote this book and it's available. It'll officially launch on March 3rd, um, on like Amazon and, um, yeah. So I'm excited only like less than a month now. So yeah yeah i'm so excited and how about your website what is that and yeah it's www.mtahaley.com and on there um we have all the information about my book we have um some blog posts that i i do every month um and there's more content to come um so if, if you just go on there and become a, um, a subscriber, then you'll be updated with all the information that I have coming real soon. Okay. We'll put links yeah. to that. We'll put yeah. a link to maybe a um, ocean drum. Yes. Um, I'm thinking of any other baby's first instruments, but I guess you probably can't go wrong in having having one of each or so, something something around yeah yeah oh there are there are so many fun things for babies um have you ever seen a a piano mat mat yeah yeah (laughs) those are so fun especially the ones that light up it's like the first kind of um (laughs) uh social moments where they're like oh when i do this this happens like a lot of the baby toys, but that um, with the visual cue and the, the auditory cue is just, it's so exciting for, <laughs> for yeah. babies. And I would add on top of that, if you're shopping for one of those, get one with some uh, polyphonic feature because it's really sad when you are ready to play a second note at the same time and you find out that your instrument doesn't do that. It's like, oh, man, yeah, take some fun out of it. <laughs> Exactly. There's there's a whole um, magical world of you know instruments out there that you can you know parents and and children can explore and you know like you said we could sit here and talk about it all day. Um, <laughs> Maybe you we'll know. just have to start a band, have a little jam <laughs> sesh later. Maybe. <laughs> um, all right. Well, um, thanks for your time. I I really enjoyed the conversation and um, yeah, we'll put links to everything. Oh, great.
Yeah, absolutely. It's been great talking to you too. And for everyone out there listening, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time. And stay tuned. You'll hear my piano solo at the end of this and at the end of every podcast. Thank you.